Wokeness is bound to self-destruct because it has nothing to do with reality. The woke believe that they can create reality by manipulating language and by forcing anyone who doesn't agree with them to be silent or to be destroyed. But ultimately, uh, it can't last. It is going to burn itself out. Hard totalitarianism is what most of us think of as totalitarianism. It's a form of government that depends on uh, inflicting pain, terror, and fear on people to force them to conform. Soft totalitarianism, on the other hand, is what I think we're dealing with now. It doesn't depend on pain, fear, and terror. Nobody's going to prison in, in uh, this new totalitarianism. Nobody's going to the gulag. There are no secret police. But the result is the same thing. You have to conform to the, the ruling ideology or you could find yourself destroyed professionally and personally. Totalitarianism is more extreme because it makes everything political. So, um, you know, we have a situation now, for example, in the United States where you're completely free to say whatever you want. Uh, legally, the state doesn't care what you say, but if you're working at a newspaper, if you're working within a university or a company, and you cross the line, uh, these ideological lines, which are always changing, you don't know whether something that's perfectly okay today, tomorrow will be like stepping on a landmine. Well, if you cross these lines, you can be fired, you can lose your business, you can be the object of hatred from a mob, you can even fear for your life. This is not a joke. But uh, so when you look up and say, there are no gulags, we're the secret police, this can't be totalitarianism, you're wrong. You are not as free as you think you are. I was in, uh, in Hungary, I'm living in Hungary this summer, and I was talking to a professor who is very opposed to the government of Viktor Orban, thinks it's authoritarian, wants to stand against it. He told me, uh, you know, I, I believe in gay marriage, I believe in gay adoption, this government doesn't, I'm opposed to them. But I don't agree with transgenderism. I just don't understand it. I don't want that in this country. Later in our discussion, he said, you know, even though I'm opposed to the government, I can stand in my classroom and I can say what I want and I don't have to worry about the government coming after me. I said, oh, but professor, you could not say what you just said about transgenderism in any American university and expect to keep your job. Uh, by the end of the day, a student mob will have, will have denounced you, the, your university president will have fired you, and you will never work again. So who's more free, the professor in Hungary or the professor in the United States? This is an example of soft totalitarianism, the idea that they achieve totalitarian results without having to use classic totalitarian methods. So we end up with this society like we have in America today where it's a, a tyranny of those who are not emotionally strong enough to live a normal society. These are the people who control uh, all the levers of power in society because they have convinced the elites that uh, the right thing to do, the moral thing to do, the just thing to do, the anti-racist thing to do is to silence and crush uh, anyone who dissents. One of the key aspects of totalitarianism is the abuse of language. Totalitarians force people to take words and hollow out their meaning. They take away their meaning and give them new meanings. And we all have to speak in this forced um, jargon so uh, we can create reality, create new realities through language. Well, we may not be able to fully resist this in the public sphere in some companies and so forth, but we have to at least create private spheres in our homes and within our own communities where words still mean something, where, where um, uh, uh, concepts still mean something. I'm trying to figure out now how to tell my own children who are teenagers uh, how to uh, navigate in a world in which they can be punished rather severely in the office for using the wrong pronoun. You know, and I, I'm, I'm struggling to know what to tell them because this has happened so fast and these kids have so much to lose if they get on the wrong side of the woke early on. At the same time, I, I don't want them to learn how to make these compromises. If we 
make these compromises early on and refuse to, to, to speak the truth or surrender to using this false language, then the more we do it, the more difficult it becomes to tell truth from falsehood on our own. I, in, in the book, uh, my book, I talk about Czesław Miłosz, who was a great Polish intellectual who wrote a book called The Captive Mind, published in the 1950s. And in it, he described how intellectuals surrender to totalitarianism. He said that there's a, um, there's a strategy that was developed in Persia many centuries ago called Ketman. And when one practices Ketman, one pretends to be something one really isn't. In other words, you practice Ketman to avoid the, uh, the sultan or you know, the powerful uh, judging you. You make them think that you're on their side, but deep down you know that what you really think is something different. And this is what a lot of people had to do under communism, Mivo said. But uh, the problem with this is if you do it enough, you eventually become the false person that you think you are not. So um, this is really, really important, a very important um, point. Uh, to do not let ourselves get used to using false language and thinking that it's true. Wokeness is bound to self-destruct because it has nothing to do with reality. The woke believe that they can create reality by manipulating language and by forcing anyone who doesn't agree with them to be silent or to be destroyed. But ultimately, uh, it can't last. It is going to burn itself out. So uh, we can be sure that wokeness will go away at some point, but before that happens, it's going to hurt a lot of people and destroy institutions. But uh, I think that the, the thing that we can hope for as Christians and as, as conservatives is that uh, we need to maintain our strength, maintain our dissidence, and, uh, and realize that our suffering matters. One of the most important things I learned, probably the most important thing I learned in my interviews in Russia and in Eastern Europe with dissidents is the value of suffering. Uh, they knew that if they were willing to suffer for what they believed in, that that was the only way that they could ever hope to win. Uh, the governments, the totalitarian governments, kept people afraid because nobody wanted to go to prison. Nobody wanted to be hated, to be an outcast. These people, these Christians, were willing to stand in public and say, you can put me in prison, you can persecute me, but I am not going to submit to the lies. And their Christian faith helped them with this because as we know, uh, our Lord suffered unto death, and he was resurrected, but, um, but he was willing to go to his own death because of what he believed in. And we know as Christians that um, our, our suffering will have meaning, even if we lose, lose the battle, even if we're ultimately killed. As long as our suffering is united to Christ, it has meaning, and God can use that to save our own souls and to redeem society. I think that is the source of our hope. Hope is the sure confidence that uh, our cause is right and that even if we suffer for it, we, we lose ourselves in prison, we lose our jobs, we lose uh, all our riches, we even if we lose our life, if our cause is righteous, we will ultimately prevail. One of my favorite quotes is from uh, the French writer Léon uh, Blois, who said, the only tragedy in life is not to be a saint. Well, all of us can be saints. All of us must try to be saints. These times we're living in now, they're different than times in the past, eras in the past, but they have their own challenges. And we are called to be saints in these times. It's a profound calling. It's something that we should answer with confidence and with joy. We're gonna have to suffer, but we have to be very, very careful not to let ourselves get bitter. Uh, one of the real heroes uh, I write about in my book was a Slovak physician called Dr. Sylvester Kirchmeri. Dr. Kirchmeri wrote in one of his, in his memoir in 1996 that he knew as soon as he was put in prison that he could not allow himself to pity himself because if he began to feel sorry for himself, for his imprisonment, for the torture they put him under, then he would surrender, he would, be, he would collapse, he would not be able to make it. So he made a decision, a firm decision early on to consider himself inside the prison as God's probe. This is what saved him. 
Uh, and he did not return uh, hatred for the hatred that the prison guards gave him and for the beatings. That man is a hero. And we need to learn how to be just like him, how to imitate those saints. He's not canonized yet. He may well be canonized one day, but uh, he was a saint nonetheless and a real example to the rest of us.